Welcome to That You May Believe, a study in the themes of the gospel according to John. Um, we've talked a lot about over the last few weeks that John most likely was written by the community of John, and we've been tracing the themes of darkness and light and water and life. And uh, for the f previous two weeks, we've been in the set of signs and discourses of Jesus. And there's seven of those. And this today is the last one of those signs and discourses. It focuses on raising Lazarus from the dead as the sign. And then the discourse is the discourse of the good shepherd. Yeah. And so as we look at this last piece of these signs and discourses, we'll continue just to dive deep into uh, what is the community of John trying to tell us about Jesus and the way of Jesus um, that affect and inform our life today? Yes. So we've already read the story of Lazarus and his raising. Mm -hmm. So do you want to tell that story for us? Yeah. So Jesus is healing, and he receives word from Mary and Martha that Lazarus is sick and that he's going to die and um, that he's in need of healing. And so Jesus says, okay, I'll go. But he waits, actually. And a whole other story takes place in the waiting. And then by the time he arrives, he's met by Mary and Martha, Martha first. And Martha says... If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And we actually see Jesus grieve yeah, as he's going totally. to heal Lazarus as well, which is really interesting because I think so often we think Jesus always knows the end of the story, but mm. I don't think Jesus did always know the end of the story. I think Jesus was experiencing things dynamically just the way we do. Totally, totally. And then you have that piece where, again, you have this Mary and Martha reality where uh, Martha kind of confronts Jesus and Mary kind of comes to Jesus as a, a lover, not a lover of, you know, a relational lover, but like a lover of him and really seeking his messianic movement mm -hmm. in the life. Mm -hmm. And so... One of the things, though, I've done a lot of studying about Martha in particular, yeah. and if you follow the stories about Martha, her faith develops in this really interesting way. And what I love about her actually is that she goes at Jesus. No, because me too. it's this very honest, um, visceral, both belief in his ability, yeah. but also just, I'm, I'm gonna tell you what I'm really feeling. And yeah. I think there are people that are fearful to tell God how they really feel. Totally. And I, I Martha, also love that all. Martha is a doer, right? Like, mm -hmm. I'm, like, if I'm in a room and Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, I'm pissed off too. <laughs> You're right? a doer. You're a Because I'm a doer. Like, yeah. I want, like, why are you sitting around? Let's get some stuff done. Right. Like, I love Jesus, but why are you sitting there? Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not anti Martha. You just see a different difference of reality of relationship. And I think we all have, we all mm -hmm. come to Jesus and to God in different ways. And I think it shows that. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, Jesus gets emotional and then he pops Lazarus out of the grave. And he comes out in his burial clothes, and then Jesus says to his friends, unwrap him, unbind yeah. him. Yeah. Which also is really powerful, that he, Lazarus needs the help of his friends to kind of fully, I think, come back to life. Yeah. No, that's Such good. Such a great story. It's a great story. It's in John mm -hmm. chapter 11. If you want to reread it and put yourself within the story, that's one of the challenges we've given each week is to read yourself into the story. And so maybe in this one... Be Lazarus, be Mary, be Martha. I have a friend who has gone through a lot of really challenging circumstances over the last several years, and she has felt that she is living that Lazarus piece mm. of being in the tomb, what's holding me in the tomb, what would set me free, who could help unbind me. It is really, it's That's a great. powerful thing That's to a, imagine. Such a, such a powerful story. So what do you think the actions of D Jesus teach us about within this sign of raising Lazarus from the dead? Well, I think there's a lot of, there are a lot of layers to it, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think that Jesus does not, I think this shows us Jesus's trust in the larger story once again. I mean, that's a, I think that's a continual theme. Jesus mm -hmm. isn't anxious when he hears this news, but he's diligent to get there. Um, what I, and I think we see Jesus's humanity as well. I mean, that, that yeah. God, Jesus is affected by, I'm not saying God and Jesus are the same thing, but that Jesus is affected by um, his friend dying, by these relationships that he holds dearly, by disappointing his friends mm -hmm. and his you know, kind of chosen family. I would call Mary and Martha and Lazarus totally. his chosen family. So I think he, um, 
he's moved by that. Yeah, and I, you know, it's, it's interesting too because I think frequently as clergy, like we get a lot of requests, right, over time, and like the longer I've been in ministry, the more I've realized that like emergency is emergency, mm-hmm. and there's while I can pray for you in the midst of emergency, there's not a lot I can do, mm-hmm. right, like. Right. Oh, so you're, yeah, so Jesus hears initially. So Jesus hears and he's like, it's an emergency, but like, I've still got to get there. And like, I have 5,000 people around me. I have to figure this out. I can't just like snap my fingers and be there and make it all better for Lazarus. Right? Like, that's interesting. We can't always do that. Yeah. Um, But we can be there. Like, the most meaningful spot that Jesus could be there was in the grieving of his friend who died. Mm. And you see him struck by grief. And you know, it's that famous passage that Jesus wept, that one that we all memorized when we were trying to memorize a verse for Sunday school. Um, and he's moved and he's engaged and then he does what he can, mm-hmm. right? Which is, I think, a challenge for us as followers of the way of Jesus is like, like know what's ours to do, know what's not ours to do mm-hmm. and figure out how to live in the tension of that yep. in many ways. Yeah. Um, and it's fascinating to see Jesus do the same. It is. I, I think it is. Yeah. Whether you're a pastor or not, I think actually. Yeah. It, it's the power of what it means to be present in an original moment and in that moment as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think, so it teaches us about humanity. It teaches us about how to, like, move forward in the midst of emergency. Um, I think what we see as well is, like, the deep relationality of Jesus in mm-hmm. this in this sign. because. You know, first he's encountered by these kind of wailers, right? The the people who are just crying. Yep. Jesus is like, okay, something big's happening. And then Martha, then Mary, then they all go to the tomb, mm-hmm. right? And there's like a big thing like, oh, Jesus was here. You know, none of this would happen. So like you just see the complexity of emotion that's around Jesus that he has to live into and, and navigate. Because this is, you know, for John, from this peak starts – the descent into the cross Mm -hmm. or the rise into the cross, whichever way you wanted to affirm that, right? So the raising of Lazarus kind of puts the nail in the coffin that Jesus has gone too far and people are going to freak out and kill him, Hmm. right? It's that And even how is it that Jesus prays in this moment too? Isn't isn't Jesus sort of like, God, I know you can do all things. And so if you want to do this. I'm praying on their behalf. Yeah. Yeah. Do this as a sign. I mean, yeah, as a sign, as basically. A sign. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, and I, you know, I do think there's a ton that we can learn, not only from the things that Jesus does in the sign, but also like the grave clothes piece, right? Like hmm. resurrection is not just a single process, right? Like you can, I can give you new life, but there's a liberating process you have to go through to yeah. live into that new life. Mm-hmm. And it frequently takes friends, frequently takes support systems. Um, you know, the thing I always wonder is like, what happened with Lazarus after this? Like, you know, how long was it? Like, I know. That he lived and... Well, and he had been in the tomb for four days. Yeah. So there was a lot of what even death he to stunk, get a wig. Right? Yeah. With the grave clothes. So imagine, like, coming alive and being in, like, death filth. Yeah. Ugh. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I... Yeah. I know. It's amazing. And I don't know. And it is interesting. It's always interesting to think about the fact that, you know, obviously Lazarus goes on and dies. So what is the point of a sign like this? You know, why did Jesus bring people back to life in these circumstances? Yeah, it's, you know, and I think there's three, is there three or four resurrections, four, including Jesus, three not, um, that happen in the ministry of Jesus. Um, You know, in in the book that Doug did, Greater Than, that we've talked about each week, Doug Padgett's book, Greater Than, Mm -hmm. he says that this sign um, shows us that God and Jesus are about liberation, hmm. that this is the sign of liberation that Jesus brings, which, you know, if you go back to the first sermon that Jesus preaches, right, which I preached a few weeks ago, yeah, um, that's part of what Jesus says he's coming here to do, mm-hmm. right? He's coming to liberate the oppressed. Right. Um, so part of what's happening in this is showing that movement of Jesus. Would you say liberation from death that this is a this is a physical liberation from death but that it's a metaphor for the liberation we'll all experience yeah i think so i mean for me definitely that you know like i think there's this 
liberation of fear of death too, which I think is probably more important for us today than, you know, or am, are you or I gonna go to the hospital and raise somebody from the dead? No, you're yeah. not. Um, but we have the power on a daily basis to liberate people from the fear of death. Hmm. Um, and, and that's certainly, I just did a funeral over the weekend, and that's certainly one of the things I find myself often saying, yeah. you know, it is sort of that we, death is not the end of the story. Death and and story. this is an example of death not being the end of the story, that, that there's something so much bigger at play that we get to be a part of. Yeah. We don't know how that works exactly. Yeah, and, and for me, like, I don't even care to put any time and energy into that. Like, that's... Like, that's all on God's side, right? So, mm -hmm. but if I, you know, let's say it is the end, that death is the end for me, like, part of what we're liberated into is what does it mean to live life in its fullness now, yeah. right? Like, yeah. how do we be, how are we liberated into freedom in this life? Yeah. Um, and I'm glad there is a something to come, right? Yeah. So I'm not saying there's not something to come, but I'm, like, for me, I think many of us live dead lives while living. Yes. And yes. part of what Jesus was coming to do was raise that dead. Mm -hmm. um, you know, th think about the Pharisees and Sadducees we've talked a lot about. Like, they're dead in the law. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Jesus is just trying to help them find freedom from that. There's an interesting thing, uh, piece that I've run across multiple times in the last couple months, which I think is always a a sign, a sign of God <laughs> yeah. at work, I believe. Um, and and it's this question, what has been saving your life? Mm. Um, and it's a question that there's a video about Barbara Brown Taylor, or Barbara Brown Taylor answering this question. And yeah. she talks about actually liberation and kind of fully living with God as actually simplifying. You know, she said for, for her, she's finding the simpler her life gets, the freer she feels, the more whole she feels, the more, you know, so she's like, I'm working less when I can. I'm savoring, you know, what matters most to me, which she said is actually pretty simple. Good work, good food, good friends, you know, good good exercise, kind of good being out and about. And I don't know, it, it connects in with this, I think, in that sort of living free in Christ, living a full life now, living yeah. whole, I always say. Yeah. No, I, I think that's great. So maybe that's what Lazarus did. Maybe, yeah, you know, I mean, maybe and maybe he just followed Jesus around at that point, like. After a nap, maybe. Yeah. I guess he had a nap, he had, I don't he know. He had a three day nap, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> dirt nap. <laughs> um, so then you move into this discourse, right, where uh, this is where Jesus talks about being the good shepherd uh, who will lay down his life for the sheep and uh, bring about the resurrection. This mm -hmm. happens in John 10, 1 through 18. So why don't we read that really quick? It says, Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all of his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they didn't understand what he was saying to them. Shocking, right? Because it's convoluted. <laughs> <laughs> so verse 7, so again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to still kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatch them and scatter them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I will lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I will bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. 
No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. I received this command from my father. Yes. <laughs> it's a lot, right? Like all of these discourses, you kind of feel like John stayed up too late. <laughs> and the community of John was like trying, you know, they're because they're doing they're doing the earliest theolo- theology work, right? Trying to discern how do we say about what we want. How do we take these stories we know about Jesus mm-hmm. and say what we want to say about who we now know he is? Hmm. And so, you know, within these I am statements, which we'll go to next week, um, there's all of this theologizing mm-hmm. of connecting him back to Moses, connecting Jesus back. So there's these conversations that are happening that... When we read them today, for me, they become really circular and confusing, right? Because if I were reading the first six verses of this, I would think that the sh- gatekeeper, the, sh- the, the person in the pen before Jesus was John, the gatekeeper. Um, oh, right, yeah. But by the time you get to the end, he's saying the gatekeeper runs away, and John clearly didn't run away. So, like, who's he talking about? Yeah. What's he talking about in all this? And I, I think we can get trapped in trying to read things into this that it may not be trying to do anyway. Yes. Yeah, which is why I think you have gone out of your way to explain the context within which these stories are told and shared and then written down. Yeah. And I think that helps a lot. And some of it is lost in lost in history on some level, yeah. and, you know, because we have we're thousands of years later. Yeah. Past these being recorded. Absolutely. Yes. So what does it mean? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I have really no idea, but I'll make some (laughs) stabs at it. But I mean, I think there is, um, like there's the conversation happening culturally between who's in and who's out, Mm -hmm. right? And part of what he's saying is, is you don't know who's in and out, I do, Yeah. right? So take that off your plate. Mm -hmm. Um, And the conversation about who was in and out then really had to do about are you a Jewish Christian or a Gentile Christian, right? Are you, so are Gentiles in in the same way that Jews are? Are people who follow the law the same way that people who don't follow the law, do mm-hmm. they get in? Yeah. They're asking these questions. So I think part of the gate and the shepherd reality of this is like the sheep will know my voice. So this is about relationship. Are we in relationship with Jesus, with God, and once we are, we'll know how to follow. Yeah. Um, so if someone's following God, you got to trust that they hear that voice mm-hmm. in the same way that you do or just stay out of their business, yeah. right? There's some sense of that. Um, and there's, you know, this fascinating part at the end where he talks about there's multiple flocks. Like if you've ever wanted a conversation to be had about interfaith and the text, like here's a perfect space of like, okay, like we don't know. I have other sheep, yeah, that do not sheep, belong to this flocks. fold. We don't I must know. bring them also. What does it even mean to be in relationship with the sh- good shepherd? You know, yeah. uh, I mean, it is. It this is a fascinating story, and I would say that w- this actually sort of sheds light on what the church continues to wrestle with, mm-hmm. which is, yeah, who is in, who is out, who is right, who is wrong. And again, I think what you said is what matters most, that it's not ours to figure out. It isn't. And that there is, and I think we're called as communities, though, to discern how to move forward. I mean, I don't think that means like, okay, great. We wash our hands of how to live for God because there's no way we can tell. Right. Um, I mean, what Jesus is saying is there's this relational piece of listening that needs to happen. And following in the way of Jesus in any part that I've seen within the life of Jesus, never includes us discerning who else is following. Yeah. Right? It's just not our role. But I believe we know when we're following and when we're not. And Personally. Yes. Yeah. Don't you? Totally. And I think that for myself, I know when I'm turning my back on what God is saying or asking me to do or, you know, what I – what. I think I said this one of the, one of the other sessions that what brings the most peace often to my own soul is what brings peace to the world too. You know, it's not peaceful right. to weave tales that include lies. It's not peaceful to you know go behind somebody's back and do something that's not 
loving and kind. And so there is this sort of flow that I think you can get into in living for God, and then you can step out of it as well. Yeah. And in the midst of all of this, I think what Jesus is saying about himself is he's the one who's going to navigate that, Mm -hmm. right? So follow him. Follow the voice, discern the voice and follow it. Yep. And in some ways, don't worry about it. Hmm. You know, don't worry about it. That that this Jesus, right, in verse 16, 17, 18, loves the sheep so much that he's willing to lose his life for it. Yeah. And is willing to lose his life and bring it back to life. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what he's claiming. You know, that's what the community of John is saying. was like, this thing that's about to happen in seven, eight more chapters in this is under Jesus's control. Yeah. Right. And and I think that's really what they're trying to point us to is um, when we think about, again, these I am statements, which we'll get to, are all discourses connecting Jesus to the I amness of God. Mm-hmm. And him naming this is connecting to some historical um, tribal identities about who God was. And he's saying to the Jewish people, like, yeah, that... God is the shepherd who lays you down beside still waters and green pastures and all that. Like, I'm that God. Yes. I'm that person. Yeah. I'm going to take care of you in the same way. It's yep. part of what is being illustrated in this text, for sure. So the litmus test then, I think, of, you know, is it God at work or is it something else? Is I, I think that verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So that I think that is the goal of following Christ, just having abundant life. When it's like that meme, right? Like, so if we were to meme Jesus, verse 10 is the perfect meme because (laughs) it's, you know, if you've seen that one, if your religion calls you to hate people, you need to find a new religion, right? If, if, if you claim to be following in the way of Jesus, but are stealing, killing and killing and destroying other people, you're not following Jesus. Yes. If the thing that you're doing is leading to more abundance of life through liberation and um, feeding the hungry, all these things, right, that these corporal works of mercy that Jesus names in Matthew mm-hmm. as separating the goat and the sheep, like these pieces, that's what it means. Yeah. So um, you can know you're not following the right shepherd if your shepherd's telling you, to do things that don't bring to life. To hurt other people. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Well, we're going to get deeper in this one coming next week. So why don't we uh, call it a, a day and put yourself within these texts, um, read into them. It's Again, it's harder to put yourself in the place of the discourses because these are um, John's community but you nuancing c- things. I think you can in these stories say to yourself, what might God be saying to me through this story? Totally. About either who Jesus is, who about God God's is. Or, to be. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, but may you go knowing that you have a good shepherd who holds the balance and is seeking life abundant for you. And may that bring you peace. <laughs>